founder Steve Swadzinski spent more than 30 years in the classroom. I spoke with him this week about his teaching philosophy and his journey to the Minnesota Senate. During your first career as a government U.S. history teacher, before being elected to the Senate in 2016, you taught more than 12,000 students. Over the last year with the coronavirus pandemic prompting people to question uh, whether mandates are constitutional, with the lawsuits following the presidential election, with the rushed confirmation of the latest Supreme Court justice. Have you wished that you were still in the classroom? I don't think a day goes by when I don't wish I was still back in the classroom. I loved every minute of it. You know, and I was lucky over the years to teach such incredible historical moments, you know, Clarence Thomas hearings and the end of the Cold War and, you know, Clinton's impeachment and the election of 2009-11, Obama's, what, what, so many incredible experiences as a history government teacher. But boy, I tell you, Shan, in the last um, year um, would have really felt my curriculum. I don't think a day went by when I didn't pick up the morning paper and, and didn't go, um, wow, I wonder how I teach this. Um, kids came to class, and they still do. They, you know, they, they're hungry. They want to know what's going on in their world. And they, they're looking to us um, um, to help them through this and figure it out. So I, 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 um, I, I think I would have had a good time teaching this year. I might have struggled a little bit with on some days with the balance of, you know, trying to teach both sides of the issue. Um, there were some things that maybe would have been more difficult in the last 12 months and um, maybe would have been earlier in my career. And so anyways, but no, it, I, um, I loved it. Now, you recently wrote a book about your life and experience, experiences. It's called um, Beyond the Lesson Plan, and it's essentially your teaching philosophy. My sense is that you're the kind of teacher that really um, thrived from the energy that was in the classroom. And so I'm curious, if you were still in the classroom, how do you think you would have adjusted to a virtual learning environment? And what do you think this is having? What is the impact on especially today's high school kids? Oh boy, um, history will judge the, the long-term consequences of COVID, but it is a pandemic. And, you know, my teaching style was sage on the stage and stand and deliver and, um, and feeding off each other in a Socratic method of, of teaching style where the kids bounce questions off me and it was a give and take type environment. And I'm not sure I would be very effective in a distant learning model, but kids are resilient. Teachers are amazing. Um, I think it's, it's amazing things are still happening in, in our schools, but it's different. It's hard. I think the, 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 the silver lining, I think the impact on kids will be um, interesting to see. I've been thinking a lot about um, like in the 30s and 40s what teenagers, 1930s and 40s, what teenagers went through um, with the Great Depression and, and you know, tyranny taking over the, the, on our, both sides of our oceans. And, and those kids went on to become the greatest generation. And that's how I feel about today's kids is, is, is that they're poised and, um, and potentially ready to become a second greatest generation. And maybe they needed this little bit of adversity to, to, to wake them up, to make them shine and become the incredible citizens that maybe that's how this all play out. And, and I think there's a silver lining I've been thinking about is the holistic child. I think we're gonna revisit um, um, the emotional and social needs of our, of our youth. And um, the last 10 or 20 years, I think we've tried too hard to, to teach to the test, so to speak, and what content can we teach them? And we've lost touch of the, of the arts and the joy of recess and all the things that um, make life worth living. Apparently, you were not a particularly good student, um, nor did you have a clear sense of what you wanted to be when you grew up. You write about how you almost died in a car accident, and surviving that experience really became a catalyst for your thirst for learning and experiences. What do you think would have happened had you not had that sort of near-death experience at, as such a young man? I wouldn't have been a state senator. I know that. Um, I probably would have, uh, you know, it was the mid 70s. The, I was growing up in a dying town, port, as many port towns on the Great Lakes were at that time. And 
Um, a lot of us were driftless and um, joyless and, and searching for more out of our lives. And unfortunately, I had a, a transformative moment that um, I wouldn't wish on anybody, but I, I woke up in a hospital bed one day and, and said, um, where, it's that classic um, talking head song, where, where, how did I get here? Where am I? Um, and um, it made me realize um, maybe I wasn't doing, taking advantage of all the wonderful opportunities in my life. And, you know, Mark Twain once said the two most important days in a person's life are the, the day they were born and the day they figured out why. And I, I think it took, for me, a car accident to figure out why I was born. And, um, but look, most of us hopefully don't have to have such um, a horrific experience to wake them up and realize that they're filled with potential and hope and dreams and desires and, um, you know. So there's a chapter where you're encouraging readers to focus on the positive and you write, quote, a society that points out people's weaknesses is a society in decline. You go on to say that we're tearing down statues and memorials of the past. We're exposing the heroes of the past for their warts and wounds rather than for their patriotic service and sacrifice. How do you reconcile that view? Uh, for those who view the relics of the past um, through the, the racism and the sexism and the white supremacy that, that feel um, damaged from those relics. How do you reconcile those two views? Yeah, you know, that's the, the million dollar question of the age we live in right now. To, to talk a little bit about what you talked about earlier, I, I've been a huge proponent of focusing on people's strengths, not their weaknesses, and not name calling. My students for years used to complain about um, um, the, the name calling and the mudslinging of political campaigns, and why do we have to drag people through dirt in, in order to become enlightened and why don't we just focus on the the policies and the issues and and the good things the candidate and the opponent um and and the uh, um the incumbent have accomplished rather than you know their weaknesses and so when i used to give tours of the capital or still do if i'm lucky enough to run across any group of children, I would take him to the Columbus statue and I, you know, I tell him what he did to the indigenous population. And you think this statue should be removed? And the kids would go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I'd point out, look at what he's looking at. And if you looked at the Columbus in a big picture, his statue was gazing at the, at the, at the Minnesota Justice Center. And I would ask the students, why do you think the artist, if they even was intentional, decided to place that statue looking, gazing, pondering upon the Justice Building? And I think I would tell, I would tell the students at that point that, you know, I didn't get things right, Columbus might think, but future generations will. And then I take them to the Lindbergh Memorial. And I'd say, what do you think? Oh my God, it's a great memorial. It's a, it is, it's a wonderful memorial. And then I talk about his anti-Semitic beliefs and um, his views on, on um, against FDR and some things like that. And I'd say, what do you think about removing this statue? And, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'd say, well, then we're missing the point. You know, look at what he accomplished. Look, look at what Columbus did. He, 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 he opened up the world um, to a part of the world that no one knew existed. Yes, warts and all. But, and Lindbergh said some horrible things about a, 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 a group of people. And yet um, both of them, what they had in common is they braved new worlds. And let's talk about what their accomplish accomplishments are. And so I've been trying to do that in my adult life with, um, with as colleagues in the Minnesota Senate, not trying to you know belittle them or when they when they get knocked down kicking them and, and trying to figure out how we're all going to move this world forward and we're going to move it forward by um by tr you know focusing on what good is in the world and not what's bad and although lessons to be learned of course uh you describe your classroom the classroom that you had for all of those years as a museum a monument to civic duty, civic virtue, and political efficacy. Yeah. You wrote that the walls and ceiling were covered with reminders to vote and participate and get involved to make a difference. So doesn't it just drive you nuts that the formality of the Senate does not allow props? Yeah, you know, um, they're good attention getters. I mean, pointing out on my wall a quote or, or um, holding up uh, uh, some object from uh, hanging chads from Florida and showing the students um, was an attention getter and that we're not allowed to use them um, is interesting. I, 
but I'm not going to judge too harshly um, on the rules of the Senate. I remember when I first got elected, somebody, um, and I wished I could remember what senator it was, said, um, you know, we can't have coffee and we can't eat on the floor of the Senate. Would you be willing to vote to change that? And I thought, well, yeah, we should be able. And then my first minute in that hollow sacred chamber and me looking around and I thought, no, I don't think I'll ever eat or drink here. This place is pretty special. And um, so I, 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 I could see both points of the prop question. Senator Steve Swazinski, we're going to leave it there, but I want to thank you so much for your time and your perspective. Anytime, Shan. Uh, look, I hope I see you at the State Fair this year. I, I hope so, too. Thank you.